So the first thing, I, I kind of put together a model um, that represents what we do in our lab that I think is, is probably pretty universally representative of, of most um, rural testing centers and what you do. So I'm going to walk through this and then ask questions if it's confusing at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is representing the kind of data that we collect with the lens. So this raw digital data is like our CSV file. It's like the file of all the data points that are collected every second. It's a big long list and it's, it's maybe a digital file, right? And if, when we collect that digital file and when we take our test, we need to co collect at the same time metadata, that is data about the test. So this would include things like um, the date that it was collected, who collected the data, maybe the temperature and the pressure, many, many things that tell us what that data file is about. Um, and then after that stage, we go through some data processing. We do some calculations on that data set. Um, and there's a process and a procedure for that. And then we have our next, our calculated test results, right? And that, those calculated test results need to be somehow linked back to our original data set, which is linked back to our metadata about the data. And this is just um, representing, um, there are many maybe ways to do that, but you need to have a clear path that's transparent and that's traceable, okay? And then there's many other kinds of processing you can do on your data. Uh, maybe another step is to create a data set of groups of data. And so you need to have another data processing step. You have another um, physical or a digital piece of data, and you also have to link that data set back to your calculated data set and back to your original data files. Any questions so far? Comments? Yeah. Oh. I think the metadata, the metadata might also include uh, some sources of error that you might have mm -hmm. something that you thought went wrong. That's a good point. Yeah. There, there's a definitely a wide range of things that the metadata can include. I, I guess including also what, uh, what stove you were measuring, what the fuel was. Um, who the company was you were doing it for, all of this data is represented in that metadata, which can be stored maybe in multiple files or formats. Yeah. Um, I would, I don't know how to do that. Make it bigger. <laughs> um, there are, there are some um, handouts that we could maybe pass around. There's not many, but maybe for the people in the back. Okay, and this is maybe one small step, one small part of your data management system. Um, for us, I'm going to make this even smaller, which is, which is, are you going to fix this right now? I don't, I don't know if I will fix it or not. talk you through it and if you have any questions or don't understand anything then ask what that box says and I'll do my best. Um, I apologize that it is kind of small. Um, so the framework that I was just describing is part of a larger framework of data that you're collecting at the same time which you also have to connect back to um, the digital data that I was just describing. So for example if you're doing calibrations you have, um, you have to relate your calibration constants to the digital data that, that you took um, in which you use that, those numbers, right? So you have to have a connection back to the original calibration, which has to be connected back to your original calibration um, um, met, uh, test, which is your original calibration raw data and your original calibration 
metadata, which is the data about the calibration which you took. Oh, this is kind of confusing, right? <laughs> um, but, in, but you really need to have this traceability um, so that you, you always know everything about your test, where your results came from, and um, where your calibrations came from. So if you have any error in any place in the process, it's traceable. Um, and so the other part is if you have a physical sample, in most cases, I think we do, and I think most people have filter samples, I think that counts as a physical sample, which you have to store. You have to take um, metadata about, such as what was the pre-weight of your filter, who weighed the filter, um, this sort of information, information about the physical sample. Um, and then you have to process information about that sample, um, which takes a process, and you have to have, and you have, in the end, calculated test results. And all of this needs to be linked together, and then linked also to your digital data. So um, that's kind of the, the overall framework that we, we use in our lab. Um, and I think the rest of this um, period is going to be a bit of a discussion about how this process, this is just sort of a framework to, to discuss, but we want to you know, um, share a bit about how um, everybody uses a framework like this, and then David is going to tell us about his experience in Cambodia. Yeah. Oh, how do I get that? Okay, so this is uh, an, an example of the data management framework we are using uh, in Cambodia. Um, so we are starting with uh, <coughs> pre-testing data, which are the data we, are, we need to uh, analyze uh, the test, we with the data we obtain during the test. Uh, following that, we have the raw data we obtain during the test. Uh, we are processing this data when uh, they are processed and we have the statistical validity. We are doing a testing report that includes all the data. And then we are storing the data. So this uh, I'm going to go in more detail in each phase. So pre-testing data include uh, data about testing equipment. Uh, it can be calibration. Uh, for some equipment, we are not able to calibrate ourselves. So, like for thermometer, we are doing checkup of the thermometer. Uh, so, we are storing data showing that the thermometer has been checked up and has passed the test. And uh, for the equipment we can calibrate in house, we are doing the calibration and storing calibration constantly. So all this is stored on the maintenance and calibration database. We are also testing the fuel prior to the test. So we are analyzing the moisture content and uh, soon the calorific value of the fuel. So all this is also stored on the fuel database with a reference on the fuel we are using for testing. Uh, and then finally we have the data about practice test and how to get used to the stove operation. So we usually do one to three practice tests uh, for stove that we are used to test, more or less. It can be more than that for uh, so any new stove. And uh, we are creating so two folders, one hard to store all the, the hard document and one soft from the computer to store all the stuff. Document. So for the raw data, uh, when we are testing stove with emission, we usually have three to five run per test. Uh, for each repetition, we get one data collection sheet when we record all the data, and one uh, CSV file, which is specific to the equipment we are using, the lamps, uh, and uh, PM filters. And we try to uh, detail and record as much information as we can uh, on the data collection sheet. Uh, 
uh, about testing condition, about any uh, like particular event that might have happened during the test, so that we can come back to it. So when we have all this raw data, we are going to uh, process them. Uh, so using Microsoft Excel. Uh, so we basically convert all the raw data into uh, analyzable data. Uh, we are so doing this for each run, and uh, at the we are also collecting all the results and making a summary sheet to uh, calculate uh, coefficient of variation between the different repetitions. So when we arrive at the statistical validity, uh, so we usually uh, consider that the test is valid when we have uh, a COV below 10% on a few views and 25% uh, on emission, which is what uh, a provincial recommend on the lens. Uh, we are writing a testing report uh, that includes uh, the description of the test, uh, so the stove, the fuel, and the testing condition, how the stove was operated. Um, we are summarizing the, the result and analyzing them, and we are also including the detailed uh, testing result in appendix. We are not including the raw data in the testing report, um, but uh, I think they have, they have to be available somewhere. And finally, uh, we are storing the data. So soft files are stored on the, I don't know if you can see, uh, but we are creating one folder with the, the year, the client, and the stove. Uh, and then we have four subfolders with raw data, process data, summary of the testing uh, result, and the testing report. Uh, we are uh, archiving all the hard folder uh, with the same uh, naming as the subfolder. And uh, we have uh, creating a simple database on Excel to uh, link all the soft and hard data. Uh, so with uh, the date of the, the test, the name of the store, the type of the test, type of fuel, uh, the code of the fuel, and a small description of the objective of the test, and then the link to the folder where all the data are stored. That's uh, how we are operating now. I don't know if you have a question or comment on that. It's more an example, huh? I think it's not a perfect um, way to do it. So. No comment, I will come with So, um, I'm just curious how you, like, you probably do more than one test in one day, so you have maybe maybe you test three different stoves in one day. Yeah. So, how, when when you're collecting data, how do you separate the data for those three tests? It, do you do you have one file that includes the whole day's data? No. And then you really separate, or you, do you how do you hand, how do you handle that? It's separated. Yeah. After after each repetition, we collect the data. So at the end of the day, if we have tested uh, three uh, stove, mm -hmm. one repetition per stove, we have three uh, different data. Yeah. And it's, uh, so you don't you don't store any data on a daily basis. Then you just store it based on each stove. Yes. Fuel yes. Okay. Thank you. What do you do? The, the, the well, be, because we are um, required to do a calibration at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, we, we store on one file, we have one spreadsheet that stores the, whole, all, the raw data for a whole day's, day of testing. And then we have a stove and fuel spreadsheet for each you know, stove and fuel combination that we test that um, 
that takes the data from the, the daily the daily data spreadsheet and then bring, brings it into the spreadsheet for that stove and fuel. And that's so we can keep a record of the calibration at the beginning and end. Um, but there's so many different ways to do it. I was just curious on how you did it. Does anybody else have any, any Very little to add. We have more or less the same system, I, I think, with the with the, da, with the with the programs you get with the lamps. It is more or less always the same. Uh, just what I wanted to add: we use Dropbox uh, to store the the processed results. This is also that we can between several people we can share the data, and um, at the same moment as one is in the lab other one can al already uh, look to the data, and so we, we can discuss. Um, uh, another question is how to save um, backup, backup, uh, safe, safety backup of the raw data. We, uh, it is a big amount of data. Up to now, we use just a X-copy batch file to, to store it on a, on a hard disk. Additionally, we had not yet the problem that we had to restore it again. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, I can just answer this. I forgot, to, but we are also backing the, the data on the server with regular backup. Uh, we are not, uh, we could scan the raw data as the backup, but we are not doing it now. Yeah, I'm just curious to know about um, if you want to monitor things 24 hours, <coughs> say if it's in an environment, in a, in, a, in a room, you want to see the concentration levels, uh, the kind of levels that stoves emit in a room. In which case, you may want to do it. I know it's online, it's zero time. But uh, you want to do it 24 hours. Or well, your interest is just the stove, just to look at the stove and not necessarily what happens in this, in this room, this environment. No, this is only uh, of, for testing we are doing in laboratory. Oh, not, not in the real? No, no. How's, how's, how's the situation? Uh, we are not doing uh, like uh, emission measurement in the field, so I cannot answer, but uh, I guess some other can. The question was about storing field emissions yeah. data yes. and managing that. Anybody with experience on that? Well, we, give it? we manage field emissions data actually in really a similar way. There's, I think the fundamental principles of how you store your data is the same no matter what what you're measuring, right? What, what, whether it's concentration or um, stove measurements, I, I think fundamentally you have a piece of data that you want to identify and you want to um, keep traceable to whatever processing that you apply to it. Was, is that satisfactory? Was it if it lasts longer than a day? Yeah. Yeah, which I mean, I I think you just need a convention for the the date that would be associated with it. So uh, when we label files, it's usually the sample ID or the household ID, some combination, and then the date is usually the the uh, date associated with the start of the sample. But it could be two hours. It could be two hundred hours that way. Uh, I think with the field data, uh, more important thing is uh, you have a more detailed survey uh, 
with the household and uh, like we use a dust track monitor to monitor the PM emissions, uh, the concentrations and uh, there what we do is uh, generally we write the manual number or the data set number that is displayed on, on the instrument also on a form. So it's kind of when we go back to uh, say our office or laboratory we should be able to relate a lot and since field is uncontrolled conditions so like if you have more survey data you can relate to it better so it's kind of having more detailed survey and i think everything else would then make sense yeah it sounds like you're you're referring to something as an entire data set um which is what we do also is we separate kind of our data into the, the a data set maybe concentration data or data in a certain region or in a certain stove. Um, but that's not the only way to do things. So that's a good point. Yeah. And uh, plus in the field, if you can also take some pictures like the kitchen condition or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can also write that picture number on, on the form. Say like, for like the photograph number, to whatever mm -hmm. it is, 50 point JPG or something. So you can always go back to see the kitchen conditions and why this kind of data is giving a different uh, graph than mm -hmm. the other. Yeah, that's also a piece of data that in the past we, I haven't stored very well is, is photograph data and referring that back to actual test data. Um, so, but I think that's important. Yeah, on the subject of photographs, we're doing a long study. Right, right now it has a two-year time span, but it will probably extend further. And so we've made, uh, I was talking about you know, writing down the hypothesis and the future work, but also, in, also photographs of each, each experiment. But I also want to say that uh, it takes a lot of time to do that level of detail and, and documentation. And so it's only really practical when it's a really big long-term study. If it's something that uh, just developing one stove in the lab, just trying to get one prototype, then it doesn't need as much documentation. It just needs to work. And then if you need later for it to, uh, to know why it works, then you figure out why it works. So I think there's different levels of uh, data that needs to be collected. But, but yeah, in general, uh, knowing where it all is is a good idea. Mm, I think in general it's very important to describe what we are doing. Um, and in the foreseen data sheets um, there is some space but sometimes you're not uh, you're not motivated to write a lot of it. So we have a description of all our pots that we are using, of all, every individual pot that we um, use in the, in the tests. We use different sizes um, with the weight, the dimensions, and even to which level five liters of water would be, that we really don't need to measure it every time. Each pot has a number. And also for the stoves, we have a dis detailed description of every stove that is separated from the tests. We just put it in and say this was stove number X, Y, Z. Um, you, sh you mentioned a sheet, the summary sheet. Uh, there, uh, for our purposes, um, are missing two or three lines to describe uh, which pot was it. Um, I don't know exactly if the initial um, batch load is foreseen, but to, to compare um, really this stove with that, with a bigger pot or a smaller pot, this would be good. We, we adapted it to our individual uh, needs, but this might be perhaps uh, good to put some more lines in, in this summary sheet that it's easy to copy from the original sheet to this one, otherwise it's a little bit complicated. And I think that, that comment is a good one in terms of what information should we be collecting and then how do we help to standardize it so that we can facilitate data sharing and then also facilitate sharing the templates that people use. So the additions that you made to the spreadsheet, we should try to reflect that 
in the aprovagial spreadsheets and the compare that to what what the Jim and Seth at EPA are doing and then the kind of the central basis spreadsheets as well that we're collecting at the Alliance. Um, related to that, I, I did want to make a, a couple of, raise a couple of issues. The first one is about sharing the data publicly as well as a, a one part, one endpoint of the process that has been described. And I, I don't think that we're ready for this discussion now, but what I'd like to do is come back to all of you and get your input on what kinds of standard templates can we have for your data that would facilitate sharing the key pieces of information for reporting, for clients, for the public, especially as your clients are, are saying, um, this testing center, they reported my stove was at this level. And that to, to kind of follow up and track your reputations and kind of provide backup evidence for those claims, I think thinking about how that information is shared when it's appropriate, when it's not proprietary. And then the other issue is on um, round robin testing. And are there pieces of data sharing that we want to be doing um, between the testing centers to help each other as we go through that process? Something we haven't talked about for round robin and what needs to be shared is just the, I mean, we started talking about it uh, when we lit the tea lead, but yeah, the method for how to, to use the stove uh, is, is really important. So for the tea lead, it's, we'd have to talk about the lighting method, would probably be the most important part about tea leads and what makes them repeatable. So we always use kerosene. That's pretty much what we do at Upper Vetro. And uh, we take the top layer of the pellets and uh, soak them in kerosene. I mean, we started to use alcohol gel, um, but it, it works equally well. It actually makes less smoke or no smoke with alcohol gel, but it just takes more. So it, either way is good though. So how many testing centers, um, if you are a testing center, do you record um, details about how you light the stoves? Is that a part of the process? Yeah. Okay. Standardized, it's not necessary to write it down. Okay. Okay. Um, it, does anybody else have any comments? I might go through some of the questions that we came up with beforehand. Um, so we were thinking of creating, you know, a. Uh, like the equipment matrix, kind of a data management matrix um, in which we can, each of the testing centers can kind of say how they, um, how they do data backups, um, if, how often they do them, just so we have a sense of who does what and you know, where we all stand. Um, so we have some key questions we'd like um, each of the um, testing centers to fill in for us, um, I, I, sent, I had some handouts, but I know there's not many of them. So maybe if um, by the end of today or the end of the, um, at least at the end of the week, you know, have maybe an answer to each of the questions if you're a rural testing center. Does that sound like a, a reasonable plan? Um, we can also add to this list um, if there's anything interesting that you maybe wonder how other people do things or or, yeah. Well, one thing that I was just wondering is that, you know, a lot of us use Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, but we've, we've heard that, um, that some labs are using something, you know, different, mm -hmm. not Microsoft. So I was, you know, wondering if we could add that as a question just for yeah. curiosity. Um, another framework that I, that, you know, when I went through the um, bubble plots, um, was I feel like each of those steps could is a question and deserves an answer such as you have raw data where do you store it how do you store it and you have a link between data how do you manage that link how do you make sure that that link is traceable um, when I was going through that process I had to think about each of those steps and make sure that I had an answer for for all of those things and um, 
I don't know if that, if that list we want to put in the spreadsheet as well. Um, it'd be a long list. Um, what do you guys think? What would be useful for you? Let's just go through these questions for now, maybe, and yeah, then, people can yeah. answer it for themselves. Yeah. And, yeah. And also, also, as we go through the question, um, think about are there additional things that you think need to be done or that you are doing to add, to, to recommend to add to the mm -hmm. list as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but maybe we can have a quick discussion about each of these points now and then yeah, fill it out. If we have time, Rainy, you, you cut us off whenever. <laughs> okay. Okay. There's okay. Okay. Then, um, are any of these priority questions for anybody? We should start at the beginning. I just, yeah, uh, I just think it's really important to write down things that are out of the ordinary. The uh, if there was. Yeah, a tila that didn't light next to the hood, that's important to note. And uh, I don't know, just anything that comes up where uh, you can see that it had a, a strong effect on the test. And so there has to be a space for that, because so, the answer to what information is collected out about each test, there's just a lot of little things that add up, but I think just a really important general thing is to have a, a space to note where things went wrong. Absolutely true. Uh, one more thing that I would like to suggest for the ro round robin testing is that uh, if each lab can record the complete process mm -hmm. and uh, maybe then if we can share it through Dropbox or whichever other means, then it can also help in comparing when if there's like a strike difference between the test results it it could help uh, like uh, though we are documenting how it is ignited and stuff like that there are many small pieces that can be found through the video that we record so if, if that is possible i think it it would be a great the way we are doing right now at least a sample maybe one test or maybe at least the ignition and example, that kind of uh, yeah. not just yeah. sitting there for 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, another thing is that if GACC can, on the website, if we can have, uh, like, if you're uploading something and if it is made available publicly, immediately it's not a very good idea. But if you have, like, logins for each RTKC, and if they can upload and only RTKCs can. Uh, like authorized person can go through that particular piece of data, maybe forms through which we can upload some of the information and data. That would be another good uh, thing of a way of sharing data. Okay. I think I, I, for the sake of this discussion, I might skip to the question about um, how your data management process is documented. Um, a, maybe a way to think about this is, you know, do you, what do you give to somebody new who's coming to your organization? Do you have any documents to give them to explain um, how, you, how you manage your data, how you go through the process? I, uh, I hadn't thought of it that way, um, about documenting how the data is documented. <laughs> But I mean, because I think what we do is uh, here's a process and then show the person how to do it. So I mean, but yeah, in general, it's take, there's a, you do the water bowling test in, in the laboratory. And so there's a hard data sheet that, that gets copied down. And then uh, that has to go into the spreadsheet. And so the person I'm training has to be there with me to see, okay, how do you get that data in the spreadsheet? And it takes a while to not push the wrong buttons. And then uh, it has to go into the summary sheet and there's uh, some folder where uh, the whole job is being stored, and then, uh, and then there's a folder where all the hard copies are being stored, and it's, it's really good to keep the hard copies because 
that sometimes things just don't make it into the soft copy. But actually, one question, how long do you keep hard copies for? Or how long do you keep soft copies for, anyway? That's uh, something that... We might have to start adding things to our parking lot. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like. Um, so what I would actually recommend, so that we can um, make sure we have time for the, for, the, for the break, and then for Evans, and for dinner, and the open mic night tonight, is um, maybe use the example, I think the example of North Carolina, in addition to that matrix, there was also the checklist. Mm -hmm. So maybe thinking about developing that list that the labs could use um, as a possible outcome of, they could use that to do the checks, but also hand that to uh, new employees or new staff as well. But I think, I think the detailed discussion, we're not gonna have time to get to that, but I think this is a really good start. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so. So, what, did, what was the conclusion? Okay. Are we on break? Are we still going? Well, maybe maybe the, the practical proposal for people to consider is along the lines of the, the documentation that was developed when we all got together in North Carolina, the next version could be um, more of the data management focused components. There may be some overlap as well. Um, are there people who would want to kind of provide input on that and, and start drafting that as a group here? If the, that's a... You mean the documentation of the documentation? Yes, yes, <laughs> I guess you could put it that way. My question would be, is there really, is there really need uh, okay, for, that is, yeah. uh, of this question because uh, the files are prepared from Aprovecho and if you follow uh, these, uh, these files, these, uh, you just uh, get the same system as uh, David presented. You, you, it, it needs it's only a little bit of discipline, of discipline to follow. All and those procedures are documented. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think so. Otherwise, we would not have the same system as, as David has. He's saying no here. Well, okay. Um, maybe some people have gone through or going through the ISO process could maybe describe what the data management requirements are for for getting certified um, I'm pretty sure you have to have a data management plan in place um, it, I don't know how sophisticated it may need to be but um, there might be some lessons from from those groups um. I know from a provincial you have the data sheets and all the relevant things you need. But if you're to go through the uh, ISO certification process, you actually need a clear procedure. For example, how do you back up your data? You could be doing it, but you don't have it written out clearly. For example, if a new person comes into the organization, they should be able to clearly do the same thing that you've been doing all this time. So you still need like a clear procedure of how you go about the entire process. So the procedures are actually very necessary, even if it's a basic thing of um, save here, put the folder, name the folder as such, it has to be clearly documented. So it's a process that has to be done. So yeah, as, as soon as I write down my process, I'll, I'll share it with all of you. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna write down documentation of data process. Does that capture some of the remaining issues? Yeah. Anything else that you feel like we haven't covered? Thoroughly enough, and we should relate it to some of these topics. Okay. Well, thanks, Sharon. For oh, Jimmy, well, I was wondering: are the regional testing and knowledge centers each each developing a quality assurance plan? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the idea. And this this would be included in the as part of that. So thanks to Cheryl and David for leading us in this discussion, getting us thinking about what we need to be doing um, as testing centers.